From the iconic Penn State University campus to the hidden gems of neighborhoods, we're here to unravel the stories behind the properties and bring you the insights that go beyond the for sale signs. So whether you're a Nittany Lion at heart or just considering a move to this vibrant town, stay tuned for expert interviews, market analysis, and tips to navigate the state college real estate landscape. But hey, it's not all about bricks and mortar. We'll also shine a spotlight on the community events, businesses, and incredible people that make State College the fantastic place it is. Get ready for a journey through Happy Valley's housing market, where we'll tackle your questions, debunk real estate myths, and maybe even share a laugh or two. So buckle up and join Mark McMaster on the Sell It Faster with McMaster podcast. The podcast that brings you the keys to your dream home in the heart of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. All right, welcome back to the Sell It Faster with McMaster podcast and the Sell It Faster with McMaster Worldwide Headquarters. Tonight we got a good friend of mine, been helping me out for, I don't know, a couple of years now. Chiropractor extraordinaire, <laughs> small business owner, uh, Edward Carlos Camacho. Oh, yeah, I dropped the middle name. I know, Kelly Saxton made me do it. That's fine. <laughs> welcome, Ed. Thanks welcome. for being here. Thanks for having me, buddy. Yeah, so... Tell us about you. How'd you end up in State College? What do you do? What's your story? You got a lot of stories. Where do you want me to start? Uh, Jersey born, raised. Uh, it's too bad, isn't it? One of those Jersey boys that transplanted State College uh, for Penn State because I didn't want to go to Rutgers. So so uh, you did go to Penn State? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to go to Penn State since, since I was like in second grade. So, like, it was, like, the journey the whole way. And then I applied to two schools, University of Michigan and Penn State. I looked at a bunch. Michigan was, like, beautiful, and I thought, wow, I just wanted to look at the place. And then I really was, like, this place is dope. Um, so I caught home. I was like, Mom, I need to apply there. And then they sent me a beautiful letter that says, you're too stupid to come here. <laughs> so I was like, all right. And Penn State already look had Look how wrong they were. I got my uh, acceptance letter from Penn State, and I was like, all right, I'm going. Like, and the only reason, well, not the only reason, but one of those like high school um, college fairs thing, they're like, oh, apply for Penn State. You don't need to do an essay on the spot. Just signed up, like registered, whatever, did all I had to do. I got accepted and I was like, all right, I'm going there, mom. And my dad was like, how are you going to go to college? How are you going to afford it? I said, I don't know. I don't care. I'll figure it out. I know. I got that out of state tuition too. Yeah. Like, he was like, you, know, you got to think there's all these people going. Like, what makes you think you'd get in? Is it? I, don't know, I believe in myself. I'll do it. And I got the letter. I said, Dad, uh, sit down real quick. <laughs> he was like, what? And I'm like, I got I got into Penn State and I'm going. Yeah, I, <laughs> I told you I was going to do this, yeah. and I did it. Yeah, so, um, you know, came to Penn State. Uh, athletic training, sports medicine was my interest. That's mm -hmm. what I wanted to do. So, Kines major, athletic training option. Halfway through there, I was like, ah, I want to do something else. There's a whole story behind that, too, but... Uh, I wanted to go to sports chiropractic. I, I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, as a little kid, that was a dream of mine, Dr. Camacho. Not a lot of people graduated high school. My environment wasn't always, you know, a lot of um, white-collar options. So it was like, you know, when you're a kid, they tell you you can do anything you put your mind to. So I was like, I'm going to be a doctor. And then, like, that actually started to happen and kind of a little anxiety of, like, what do I do now? <laughs> so that was a little scary. But uh, started at State College. Came here for the four years, went to Florida. The last week of me being in State College, I met this girl named Jenna. And I met her on a Saturday. I knew of her, but like we actually like talked for the first time on a Saturday. The following Saturday, I was graduating and leaving town. And now she's my wife. Problem is, she's from here. So when she's like, hey, let's go live near family and start a family, I came right back to Center County. So that's how I started here, but that's why I came back here. Where'd you go in Florida? Daytona. Oh, and so that was like your first doctor chiropractic job. That was my school. That's oh, where that's I, where you went to school? Yeah, so I went from okay. uh, State College for undergrad. Then I went to Daytona Beach. It's Port Orange. It's like the next town over mm -hmm. for uh, Palmer Chiropractic College. I was there for three years. Then I went to North Carolina for an internship. Stayed there for a little bit. We thought we were going to like it there. Jenna was at... Uh, Wake Forest. She was supposed to be at High Point. That didn't work out. She went to Wake Forest. We didn't like that. Stuff happened. We were like, no, we're just going. We're leaving. So we left North Carolina. We went to Jersey, lived with my parents for a little bit. 
Um, the weird part is like when I was living here on Wapalini Drive across the street from the YMCA, I'd like go on jogs and I was like, oh, this is dope. I'm going to be an old man. I'm going to be a Penn State fan. I'm going to have season tickets. I'm going to live over here in one of these like little community homes. And like that was my like retirement plan. And, you know, life kind of brought me here 30, 40 years too early. So whatever. It's cool. I like it here, but it's a great spot. Uh, I think I'm biased, but having a family here is pretty cool. It's fun. It is. I, I think this is a great place to live. I think it's a great place for families. We have so much stuff to do. We got a lot of the outdoors things. We mm. got, you know, the big concerts, you know, Drake and Lil Wayne was just here. Jake and, Hall. Yeah. <laughs> just like you, uh, you know, Bill Burr, you know, all the big names. We got, you know, college level sports, all that kind of stuff. But we don't have a lot of the bad stuff. Like we don't have to worry about a lot of crime. You do. And, it's just less. Yeah. But I don't think it's a worry. No, no. Like it's just like, where you're from in Jersey, it's different. you are in a different condition <laughs> than you are when you're walking around here. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, Jenna's like, you, you're always like looking around like you're not, you're paranoid. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm just aware. Right. I'm not paranoid. I'm just paying attention. Yeah. And where I'm from, you need to. And over here, you don't have to as much, but I still do. So it's just like, I see things coming before it happens. And Jenna's like, how do you see that? how do you see? Like, I don't, I just keep my eyes open. Yeah, so, so I get the hard. same thing from my wife where I'm always looking at the door and I, whenever someone walks in, I'm turning my head and looking and, you know, it's it, people, I think a lot of people that don't kind of live in that mindset think it's weird that, you know, I'm sitting there having yeah, lunch with someone. You're a crazy prepper. Yeah. And every time somebody else walks past you, I'm looking at them just mm. to see what they're doing. And, you know, it's, I feel like th your environment's going to give you so much data. So if you just keep your mind open and your eyes open, you're going to get a lot of input. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't military trained. Like I know people are and people are conditioned and trained what to do and why. I just learned from an urban environment what could happen if you don't pay attention. Sure. So that was ingrained in me. I learned through some hard times and some situations that I don't want to repeat. And I thought when I'm older, I'm not raising a family here. So I'm older and I have a family and I'm not going over there. Right. <laughs> Because it's, it's a better condition. It's That's kind of what we were saying. It's different. That's all. So how? So you came back to Center County, and so then where were you working? What did you? What were you doing? When I first came here, yeah, I bought an office. So that I, was just where you started. I literally cold called. I was in Jersey yeah. working at a fur chiropractor right out of school. Yeah, and I was pissed. He was annoying. Uh, <laughs> I, I, we're out of here. Yeah, he just took advantage of a hard worker. Mm -hmm. And um, pay structure wasn't right. You know, the, the rules were a little ridiculous. Uh, I would get ridiculed if I wasn't wearing a tie on a Saturday morning. Like, dude, like I'm dressed up, dress shirt, nice pants, super fresh, fresh haircut, like looking really, really good. Like tailored clothes. I don't feel like wearing a tie at 8 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. Right. So I'm not wearing it for these two hours and I'm at the office. Mm -hmm. Well, he'd ridicule me. And then Sunday, it's like, you know, seven, eight hours of just Pee Wee football leagues, working the sidelines. I'm like, dude, do I ever get a day off? It's like, no, no, you need to learn how to work. I was like, all I do is work. So it was like kind of like a smack in the face. And I realized just, he looked at me as a profit option mm -hmm. and he wanted to sell me his practice and he tra treated me well until he found out I don't want to buy it. And then he treated me pretty pretty poorly mm -hmm. so i was in that office i walked out of the office i walked into the parking lot i'll never forget it i stood in front of the front door i called this random 814 number i was like hey my name's eddie uh, i'm just calling around to see if uh, the owners of the practice were available or um is there a possibility i can speak with them I'm like no, no uh, they're currently with patients can i help you i said yeah i'm currently looking to relocate to state college and didn't know if the practice owners were looking to retire or sell their practice and the girl's like, uh, 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 can I get your name and number? <laughs> 15 minutes later, my phone called. And this guy was like, hey, this is Dr. Dave, blah, blah. And that was the beginning. And he's like, we should have a conversation. That weekend we drove up, that weekend was 2016. We started, he didn't have an idea. It wasn't a plan. It wasn't offer. It wasn't for sale. Like it was just me looking for an opportunity. I saw this office. I found out there's older docs over there. They're not going to live and work forever. So at sure. some point there's going to be a conversation. Yeah. So if I get my foot in the door now, maybe there's an opportunity. We went, we had a couple conversations, a couple hours. I went back again. I would say after four or five months, we were just back and forth paperwork. I'm asking questions, statistics, numbers, revenue. They had no idea what the hell they were doing. <laughs> how many patients you see? I don't know. How many new patients that like, there was just no 
no statistics. Sure. So I'm asking questions, getting no answers, thinking, all right, these people are not ready. I'm ready to go. And you can't answer my questions. And this was getting a little bit weird. Um, so I kind of just let that kind of fizzle out. But in my little no handy dandy notebook, one night I woke up living in Old Bridge, New Jersey, and I literally like wrote like a three page, two, three o'clock in the morning, I couldn't sleep. Like, this is gonna be my office. Like I literally professed it, wrote it like in detail, like aggressively, like on the edge of my bed, no bed frame, just <laughs> box spring with a mattress and a little like old wooden <laughs> nightstand, just aggressively writing. I wrote two, three pages of like how this office was going to be mine. And gosh, within the next two weeks, the opportunity fell apart. And I was like, shit, now what? And, you know, long story short, I got another job. I worked for another guy. I was living in Jersey, working in PA, driving an hour back each, each way. Um, that's how I met my building manager. She worked in that office. Um, and then me and Jenna had a conversation. I was living in Yardley. We moved to Yardley. We loved Bucks County, loved Bucks County. Um, that was hard to leave because we really did enjoy that area. And she's like, I want to be close to family. And where we were, she was about, my wife was about 3, 315, 320 from her family. And I was about a little over an hour, 15 hour, 20 from my family. We didn't have much friends in the area other than the people we worked with. We recently had a friend that um, passed away tragically. And that was very, very hard for us. So we just kind of felt isolated in a beautiful area. And she's like, you know, I want to have a family. Um, I was looking at an opportunity in Colorado. A buddy out there was like, luring me, come out. I'll pay for you to fly out. Come see if you like Colorado. I loved it. He said, come out again. Let's talk business. Stayed there for like a bunch of days. Uh, it just didn't work out. It was too far. I wanted to go. My wife was like, it's too far from family. We're at this age. We wanted to start a family. And I'm like, you know what? This makes sense. Um, so we turned on the Colorado option. And we we're having a conversation. It, literally in April, probably exactly six years ago from this month, because it was the week before Big Blue and White, which is like right now. Yeah, so middle of the month. Literally, mm. um, probably exactly six years ago. Uh, we had a conversation at night. She went to bed. I stayed up till like one o'clock in the morning. I'm going through my emails, trying to find this lady's email address. And I'm like, it's just something at Yahoo, something at Yahoo. And I find it. I email this husband and wife in State College. I'm like, hey, it's Dr. Ed again. Just curious if you guys are still exploring. Um the option of selling. And she was like, well, she emailed me the next day. Ironically, we just had a sale fall through. Two gentlemen were supposed to buy the practice and at the day of signing, they didn't follow through with it. Wow. So she's like, we are looking, we are interested, we are ready. We have things ready, prepared paperwork, contracts. However, we just got burnt and we're really not looking for games. We're serious about this. So I'll be up in a couple of days. Long story short, if we just fast forward, <laughs> that guy's name was Dr. Travis McDonald. And now he's in our office again. So him and his friend are supposed to buy the practice. Oh, wow. And I didn't know that. Like literally like a year ago, a little yeah. over a year ago, I, he came in, reached out about an opportunity. I brought him to the office. I gave him a tour. He's like, I've been here before. I was like, oh, okay. Like, cool. A bunch of people have been here before. Yeah. I actually tried to buy this place before you. And I was like, <gasps> Oh, shit. <laughs> so it was a little weird, but uh, full circle. I and mean, it came full circle for me three years mm -hmm. after I first reached out to them. Um, it worked out. You know, long story short, it worked so out. So you bought that in 2019? 2019, April 1st. So this Monday was five years for us. You bought it on April 1st? Yep. April Fool's Not Day. Not a joke. <laughs> I literally. Moved Not a joke. Literally. I, yeah. I drove. We, my birthday is the last week of February. That week was my last week working in Yardley. So that was like the last week of February. We moved like two days later. The first couple days of March, we moved to State College. I was in the office doing stuff. Kind of, I was doing private marketing for them, like behind the scenes, trying to gather email address, doing like email marketing. They had nothing. Right. No website, no fate, like nothing. Yeah, they were very old school. Yeah. Like So I had to start from scratch, but like had to work behind the scenes as I was working in another office. Yeah. So it was kind of like a, I was a ghostwriter for a couple months. I had some data. I got in the office. I started like showing my face, setting up my desk, bringing things in, like slowly just becoming present. Then the middle of March, I actually started working for them uh, for two weeks. And then April 1st, we signed over ownership. And then the wife was working for me for two weeks. So we had like this like little transition yeah. over 30 days. And they were like, they wanted to stay longer. And I didn't need them to stay longer. Like at that point in my career, like I knew what I needed to do. And like the delay and opportunities I had before that prepared me for this. Mm -hmm. So like I was grateful that for the three-year delay, 
of when I thought I was going to get it in 2016, I wasn't ready. Yeah. And I learned that looking backwards, but 2019, I was definitely ready. And April 1st, we signed paperwork, end of first quarter. It made a lot of things easy for just taxes, like documentation, sure. reports. Like it was just very easy. Just a um, clean break for the business. Like taxes are done before, yeah. before April 1st. So you're waiting for your stuff submitted. So like all their business taxes were done. So it was like, it was just very good timing for us. Um, and unfortunately, Dr. Dave got hurt slipping on ice end of January and couldn't practice. So his wife was like solo practitioner doing two doctor schedules by herself and oh, she wow. wasn't young. Yeah. So that warned her quickly. And she was like, can you come earlier? And I was like, uh, no, I can't. <laughs> so um, that kind of st- that, that kind of was a little bit of a fast forward button. But we found the place to live. We moved. Uh, we bought the business and everything has been a fast forward button since then. Yeah, especially at the rate that you move, because <laughs> I've known you for a while now. Um, Coffee. <laughs> yes. I, I am a little disappointed because I have never seen you in your office in a tie. I, you won't. <laughs> the day I signed April 1st was the last time I wore a tie in that office. Yep. That's the benefit of being a business owner. Yeah. You can do whatever you want mm-hmm. because no one's going to fire you. Yeah. It's, well, I could fire myself if I wanted, but. You could, but it's probably not going to be over a tie. No, it won't. No, no, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, because I think I'm trying to figure out when you and I started kind of talking and it was actually when I was building this space that we're in right now. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you, you know, you would message me on Instagram like, Hey man, that looks really cool. And then eventually I was like, Hey man, my back's all jacked up. Can I come and see you? And you're like, yeah, man, come on in. And you and I just hit it off. We've been friends ever since. And, um, I had only ever been to one chiropractor before that. And it was, you know, at the beginning of that relationship, we'll call it, it was, it was great. And then it, I started going in there and it was like, I was in there for three minutes and it's like, Hey, all right, well, see you later. And there was no relationship. There's no like, Hey, how's it going? You know, what's going on with you and, and things like that. And then going to see you was a completely different experience. And, and I, you know, even I was at dinner last night and, and I was talking about you and I'm like, yeah, I'm doing a, doing the podcast with my buddy Ed tomorrow. He's my chiropractor, but you know, also my friend and they're like, Oh, chiropractor. I'm like, Hmm. that's, I used to have that same thing. I have an uncle who's a doctor. He used to tell me all the time, Oh, those chiropractors, they, they get a whole class on running a business and that's what they're really doing is they're running a business. No, and they don't teach us nothing about running a business. Right. Well, that's, that's what he thinks. <laughs> that's a problem. Yeah. That's what my that's uncle Ross problem. thinks. He probably listens to this. <laughs> um, but so I always had that, that viewpoint as well, you know, Oh, those guys are quacks, whatever. And I'm sure there are some out there that Absolutely. there's a lot of different ways to practice Absolutely. Absolutely. that kind of care that, that you do. But what I really liked about seeing you is you, you're very sports oriented. It's that sports medicine kind of background that you have. Um, you're, you're not big into like snapping x-rays unless you really need it. You're, and I'm always amazed. I can go in there, I can lay on your table and you will kind of look me over and look at this and go, Oh man, you're all screwed up. And it's uh, it's right here. I can see it. I'm like, how do you even know that? Like, it's just looking at me, looking at the way I move. And I'm just always amazed at that. And also your, your philosophy of, Hey, you just keep doing what you're doing because you're going to regardless. Mm -hmm. And I'll just keep fixing your problems because you know, you're not one of those people that tells people, Oh yeah, it hurts when you do that. Well, you should stop doing that. Mm -hmm. If I came in there and said, well, it hurts when I do this, you, you would tell me, okay, well just keep doing that, but this is what we're going to do to fix it. Mm -hmm. You need to move this way or you need to do this exercise. You're, you're unilaterally messed up. You you would use some fancy term and tell me what to do. I speak English. You do speak English, but it's a weird English. Uh, (laughs) old English. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I also, I also like when, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what's going on with my body and I can see your little wheels turning in your head and you start going, this goes like this and this goes like this. And blah, blah, blah. You actually say it out loud. This muscle connects here. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, give me your arm. And then you just start doing some stuff, which is usually incredibly painful until you fix it. And then afterwards, I'm like, that was horrible to go through. I'm always scared to tell you what's wrong with me because I know it's going to mm. be really painful. But then after the fact, it's probably going to be fixed. So also. On my drive here, I literally thought 
some patients that are athletes, I work pretty heavy handed on. Mm -hmm. Other patients that are grandmas, I'm very light touch. Mm -hmm. And I know not every patient, not every human, wants a heavy handed practitioner. I also know not every person wants a very soft, Swedish massage, fluff, fluff, like, oh, I feel better type thing. I mean, I would like that, but it probably doesn't it doesn't work as well. It doesn't do much. So I, when talking to an athlete, was like, oh, man, that hurt. I'm like, okay, listen, you are a competitive division one athlete, really good at what you do. You compete all year round. You've been playing this activity, sport, for, I don't know, 20 years at this point, 15 years on average. Training hurts. Lifting hurts. Sprints hurt. Getting kicked in the shin or elbowed in the ribs, that hurts. So if you're doing that every day for three, four, five hours with practice, with teammates, with video, with whatever, sitting in a plane, sitting in a bus, traveling, like not every part of your day is comfortable. But how are you going to come to a therapeutic rehabilitation, performance enhancing environment and think I'm just going to like, okay, breathe gently. Okay, crack. <laughs> okay, great. Now, like that, no, it doesn't work. Right. So when you're working with a certain type of personality... I know you lift weights. I know you shoot guns. I know you do both of those a lot. I know you do a lot of work on the computer. You drive a lot to go to different places. I understand how you use your body. I also, because we built a friendship and a relationship through just conversation organically and watching you through social media as a stranger, like I've learned your psychology and drive. We've had conversations. I've got to know you as a human, as just Mark, not Mark the realtor, just Mark. So like, as I get to know the patient, okay, this is the patient, this is what drives them, this is who he is, and this is what he does. If I remove anything in that scenario, I'm changing your identity. That's not my job. My job is to fix a problem. So if I learn, okay, Mark likes to exercise for various reasons. Mark likes to shoot firearms for various reasons. Mark likes to do these types of workouts for various reasons. Because I know the answers to those, you're not going to stop. So I have to realize, okay, as a practitioner, here I have an active person with a problem. They're paying me to help them. They're not going to change their lifestyle because I gave them a suggestion. So you're going to keep doing it. Okay, great. How does the body work? Figure that out. How are they using their body? Figure it out. What's their postures and repeated movements? Figure that out. Okay, take the person, apply their lifestyle to it, and just do your little nerdy chiropractic science to their life. It's not that complicated. For me, it's not. But the more people I meet, I realize maybe my perspective is a little different, a little unique. I only know me because I only go to me. I don't go to other doctors, other chiropractors. I don't, I don't. Like I can talk to them, but like we don't, I don't lay on their table. So I can't judge what someone's doing and I can't compare what someone is or is not doing. I just do Eddie, period. And I'm starting lately, I would say over the last six to nine months, really realize I have always been a niche. I've never been a general population person. I've always been niched, always. I just didn't have the confidence to see that in myself. Now I'm realizing it's really easy for me to pull data away from someone, from conversation, from body language, from explanations, how they live their life, what they do, what I see on social media. If I understand the person, treating the problem's pretty basic. A low back problem, L4 disc, it's L4 disc. It's, it, I know what it's gonna do. In, min, in a mild condition, moderate condition, or severe, I know what it's going to do. But the person in living that body, who's abusing that body, that's creating this condition, you have to get into the psychology of that human and make them understand you can still squat. You're just going to have to be lowering the weight 20%, maybe for the next two weeks. I have to do a little bit of work. We're going to have to rehab this a little bit, reduce some inflammation, treat, teach some mobility, flexibility type exercise give you another type of drill to do or a new therapy that can help aid you to squat better with less pain. And they're like, oh, thanks, Ed, I feel great. And I'm like, it's just another day, next patient. So like, I appreciate your perspective, but I'm just doing my job. Right, but you have to realize, like you said, you don't see other doctors. That's not the same perspective that other people have. You know, if you go to someone who's not, if you're a sports type person and, you know, I'm getting up there, I'm getting older, but I still like to do those things and, and be active and do stuff. But if you go to someone who's not sports focused and, and you tell them, Hey, I did this, I hurt myself. I did blah, blah, blah. They, there's a lot of them that would tell you, Hey, you're, you're getting old. You shouldn't do that stuff anymore. You don't ever say that because like you just said, when you, if you have to do that with someone, 
you're changing them as a person. Because if that's who that person is, if their whole thing is working out, like me, working out, tactical games, shooting, um, staying in shape, just running, half marathon, whatever. If you tell them, hey, uh, you know, you got a back problem because you fell down the steps at the ale house. <laughs> um, you know, Good story. <laughs> yeah, except it's not. Uh, you know, because you fell down the steps at the ale house. Well, you can't do tactical games anymore. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't, you can't go run a half marathon. Like for some people that I'm not saying it's life ending, but it's definitely life changing. Like you, that person might forever just say, well, I can't work out anymore. I'm just going to sit on my couch and gain 50 pounds and shorten my lifespan. Um, your last podcast with John, mm -hmm. what is written on the back of your phone? Uh, on my phone? Yeah. Memento Mori. And what does that mean? It means for remember you must die. Right. So you're going to die anyway. Yeah, you said exactly that multiple times. Yep. So go damn ski down the slope. Yeah. Go pick up your damn grandkids. Go run. Like, just do it. Right. You're going to die anyway. Oh, I believe that. But there's some people <laughs> and there's some people in the medical world that will just tell people, hey, um, you know, you, you can't do this anymore. You have to give that up. Even if really they don't have to. Well, they need to find a new doc. Right. They do. And that, you know, your philosophy of. Hey, just keep doing it. I'll keep fixing you. And, and that's something you said that I'm sure you said that jokingly to me, but I take that very seriously. Like when I do dumb stuff, I'm like, oh, well, it'll just fix me. I'll go. I'll go see Ed. I'm going to see you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I screw my back up on Monday. So I took Steph's appointment tomorrow because mm -hmm. mine was next week. And uh, I'm like, well, Ed will fix me. I'll figure it out. I appreciate your confidence in me. <laughs> I, and I do because, and it's, it is amazing to me that, um, I will do stuff. I mean, I, I remember I was, you and I were looking at commercial spaces and I said to you, we were standing in the parking lot of an office building. And I'm like, dude, my wrist hurts really bad today. Mm -hmm. You're putting your daughter in her car seat and you're like, give me your hand. And I'm like, Oh, okay, here you go. Whack. And you just, you did something to my wrist. It almost put me to my knees. It hurt so bad, but you fixed it. And you were able to grill the rest of the day. Like in the parking lot of an <laughs> office building, you just whacked my wrist and did a couple other things and it hurt like crazy, but it fixed it. It's, it was like some sort of voodoo magic you do over there. It's calculated. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it is. <laughs> I see your little wheels turning in your head. Watch this. Um, so you brought it up, uh, division athlete, division one athletes. You work with a lot of the Penn state athletes. Uh, how'd you get into that? Uh, that's a pretty interesting question. The story itself is pretty unique because I had one gentleman reach out to me in a DM mm -hmm. and said, Hey, I need ART. And what's ART. So that's the point. Like the kid didn't even know what it was. Yeah. He was just told by someone he looked up to, they said, Hey, you need to find someone who does ART when you're at school. So he came back from across the country, went on social media, messaged me on in a DM and was like, Hey, I need ART. And I was like, how did you know I do that? He's like, I did it. <laughs> I was like, I'm cold oh, calling. Okay. Uh, but he was like, all I need is that. That's it. I just need the ART. And I'm like, all right, I could do that. That's fine. And college athlete didn't have a lot of money at the time. So like, a new patient coming in, doing the whole process. Like it just was too much money for him at that point. So he was like, I just want ART. That's it. Oh yeah, cool. Uh, here's the rate. We'll just, I'll just do ART. That's it. That gentleman ended up to have a really good season in his sport and win a national championship. He went on to win a couple more after that. He kind of had me as like a secret weapon for a little bit. Um, and then other people would ask him and he wouldn't really say anything. He would just, he's always, a, he's typically a pretty quiet kid anyway. And then someone else on the team won their first national championship. And after that kid won, he's like, all right, cool. Tell me who your dude is. And the first patient I reached out to me in the DM was like, all right, fine. You're going to like him. Here's his name. Here's his number. Like he's intense, but you're going to like him. So he sent me another athlete from his team. And then that athlete um, was already good at what he did, but he sent me more. And then athletes talk, locker rooms talk. And then I got to meet some of their friends just by working at their apartment, at their training facility, whatever. And then I met more people and then I get, became familiar with others and like, they're like, hey, I have this issue. Can you help me? And like, it just kind of slowly organically grew one person by one person by one person. Uh, and it was all in one sport. And then all the athletes know everybody within other sports. So then it kind of went to one other sport. 
and then another sport, and then those athletes, and then you get three or four from that team, and then three or four from that team, and then um, it just literally slowly organically grew from one, one DM, one athlete. And I've worked with a bunch of athletes at many levels since I was in college. Like, that, that wasn't a problem. It sure, you said you started at Pee Wee football. And it, well, <laughs> even when I was here, like Penn State athletic yeah. training, like kids I worked with were in, the, were in the Olympics. Like a year after I was working on them, they were in the Olympics. Um, like I've had friendships with some of these individuals where like they were just college athletes my age. One kid was just learn, asking me how to learn how to cut hair. And I'm teaching him how to cut hair. Turns out he became a very, very, very good athlete at what he did. And I'm like, wow. So yeah, I taught him how to cut hair a little bit. So like, it was just like weird things that we were just students. And then some students were really good at their sport and they became, they made a name for themselves. So then I organically grew that way. And then it kind of morphed into more and more and more. And then athletes wanted more of my time. But it was like, okay, this is not the business model I'm in. Like this is insurance. Like what we're doing is not really insurance. Like, so like it kind of just became a complicated business situation where it wasn't always worth my time to be doing what I was doing, but I was enjoying it. Mm -hmm. So it was like, okay, I'm enjoying the work. I'm enjoying the patient base, but like I'm not getting paid what I should be doing because this is not set up properly. And got a business coach. I was like, hey, this is what I'm going on. I, um, I like working with these people. I have some staff that can help me do other things. Like, how do I do this? And he was like, oh, do this, do this, do this, do that. You know, structure it this way, spend more time with people. And I'm like, huh, that sounds interesting. Long story short, I overwork myself, go to the hospital, spend a couple days there. I'm sitting there thinking like, you know what? I got I to gotta change how I do things here. And I want to spend more time with people because I know the more time I spend with someone, the bigger change I can get. So these athletes want to get better now. They want longer appointments. They like they 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Like that's, that's not enough for them. Right. So I started realizing one little Eddie passion was like flying through the roof, spending more time with these athletes. Psychologically, I understood them because I'm just as crazy as they are in my own sense. So we all hit it off. So I built a lot of friendships with these athletes that much younger than me. Then it turned into this mentorship where people would just shoot me questions. Hey, this girl said this. I don't know what to say, but I really like her. My dad <laughs> said this. Hey, I have to move apartments. Is this a good place to live? Is this too much money for rent? I'm like, now I'm like a second father to these people. And some in some situations, I'm like a big brother. So I love mentoring. I love helping people. So I loved it. So that kind of grew into a whole different relationship where like now these patients turn into like buddies and now they come to my daughter's birthday party and then they refer more people and then i'm getting to know their parents or grandparents so like just the other week in kansas city someone did well and at the end of everything the father comes up to me gives me a big hug and he's like emotional i see the grandfather later and the grandmother they give me a big hug and they say thank you for taking care of my grandson and it's like it's powerful it's powerful to realize you're making an impact on the grandparents of these athletes you're working with by just being genuine right i just want to help you i want you to do good at what you do I'm living my dream. I want you to reach yours. Right. So let's do this together. And it has grown where now my patient base is definitely changing a little bit to more of the active population, not all just athletes, but people that move their body. Uh, it doesn't matter their age. People that move their body and care about their health. Right. Period. And I think people, I mean, I, so a couple of things there. I think one of the reasons that those athletes want to work with you is you have that same level of intensity <laughs> that they do. For what you for for what you do, you have that same level of intensity for what they do. Um, so I think that's what draws a lot of them to you, and I think that's what draws me to you as well. Like you're you're just very intense. You're you're it, maybe it's the massive amounts of caffeine you ingest on. A it's regular. not that much. It's just really really good tasting coffee. I'm sure it is. Uh, <laughs> we'll talk about your coffee uh, obsession later and how much it has cost me as well. Uh, but you know, also just, I think there's a lot of people, especially in this town that they want to be around the Penn state athletes because for, for some sort of clout chasing. And that's not you like you're doing it because you're passionate about the sports that they're in. You're passionate about helping people as athletes. You're hap passionate about just helping people get that 1% better every day yourself included because mm -hmm. i know you're you're big on on personal development um and like you said mentoring people and helping other people you know i you post a lot of 
like mentoring type things on social media. And, and I love seeing that stuff. Yeah. I'm always like, Oh, so, what's Ed saying today? Um, I've realized and I've accepted. I have a lot of passion in my body. I have a lot. I have, I have a very, very strong flame that literally comes out of my pores without, without being poked, without being mm -hmm. pushed. Like it's just natural for me. So I have been trying to harness that a little bit more where this is who I am. I talk fast. I'm very intense because I have lived life a little bit. I've learned some lessons where like not everything is promised. Not everyone lives tomorrow. So it's like, it's now or never. So you either want to do something now or, or you don't. And I don't have time to waste sitting here just thinking about it. Like it's now or never like move or take a poop or get off the toilet. It's that simple. So no passion, no purpose. And that's something I believe very, very deeply. And in the same thing in vice versa sentence, like, no purpose, no passion, no passion, no purpose. Like those things are equal to me. So if it's not passionate in my heart, I'm not doing it. It's not worth my time. Right. Someone the other day was like, hey, can you cut my hair? Nope. <laughs> okay. I thought you cut hair. Just because I can doesn't mean I will. Right. And I'm not passionate about cutting hair like I am being a chiropractor. Right. So I really love helping people. And chiropractic is just my state of Pennsylvania license to do what I do. But at the end of the day... I want to help someone live their dream. If I'm living mine, it's selfish to only live mine and say, screw everybody else. So if I know what your dream is, like this morning I had a gentleman uh, message me. I saw him yesterday. He was driving to Jersey. He had a workout with the, Jet, the Giants today, and he has a workout with the Jets tomorrow. And he literally messaged me, my body feels great. I kicked ass on my workout this morning. So here's this young boy who... If he hears this or sees this, he'll know who it is, but I'm not going to say it. His dream was to become a professional football player. Mm -hmm. He's very, very close. And he had a workout opportunity with a team that he's been communicating with today. He has another workout opportunity with another team tomorrow. He had a really good pro day. He came to me recently and was like, hey, I, I have five weeks to the draft, and I want to be as best as possible. So when someone calls me, I get on a plane at my best peak performance. Cool, let's go. Let's do this. I literally in Kansas City took the meeting. I got home from Kansas City. He was in the office that Monday. We started the next day. Like it was that quick. And I today had so much joy reading that one little sentence, realizing I saw this kid yesterday. There was something I didn't like that I saw. We drilled it. We worked on it. We spent an hour together. He got a good workout with me. We treated some things on his body. And I thought, man, he has to drive three and a half, four hours. Like, how, how is this going to handle? Like, how is this going to hold? You know, when you wake up in the morning, if you're sore, like, do this. Like, I told him everything to do step by step. If he had soreness, if he felt good, like, I wanted him to go on the field in front of this opportunity to have the potential opportunity to live his dream and get picked by this organization. And I take it personal. If I can't help someone, I take it personal. I stay up at night. I can't sleep. I'm writing things in my notebook, like, try this with this person. Try this. Do this. Like, I want to help the person. So if you're like, hey, um, I need to make this. It's Valentine's Day. I need to make my, di my girlfriend dinner and I don't know what to do. And the kid's 20 years old, first girlfriend, spends all his time training and has no idea how to cook chicken. I'm going to help the damn kid cook chicken. Yeah. Like it's just that simple. But it comes down to just my natural drive and desire is I want to be of service to others. That's it. I want to be of service to someone to a point where... I can make an impact that's positive on their life. I want to be a role model that is positive who, for whoever is looking up to me in whatever way. Like, I don't want to just be a role model because anyone could be, but I want to be a positive role model because like Dennis Robbins, a role model to some people, but not who I want to mimic after. Sure. So like I was very intentional with the type of young man I wanted to be. And now that things happening, people are like, Oh wow, look at Ed. Like, other than my wife, no one knows the amount of sacrifice and how much tears and sleepless nights has occurred in the last decade. No one has an idea. So it's like, oh, wow, look at that. Look at all he has opportunities. Like, it's not about the athlete. Screw the sport. Screw the athlete. This is a patient that has a complaint, is paying me to help them, and my job is to deliver the services. I don't care what team you are, what jersey number you are. Like, it doesn't matter. And the other day, someone was like, hey... Can I meet so-and-so? No. <laughs> no. Like, could you? Can I schedule you? Tell you when they're coming in? Yeah, but why? Yeah. Like, that's not what... This is my business. 
This is an office, a medical facility. This is not a meet and greet in the parking lot so you can just, by mistake, run into someone in the parking lot. Like, I'm not doing that. Right. So I purposely have to put people on my lunch at the end of office hours after I put my daughters to bed on a weekend. They come to my garage. Like, I have to literally take certain people and not bring them to the office because it's too much of a distraction. Like, I don't want to do that. Right. And it goes back to that, what I was just saying. Like, there's people that do that just to chase clout. You know, oh, I work on this guy. I work on this guy. I do this. I do that. You go out of your way to not tell people who it is. I mean, e- even your general patients. I mean, there's people that they tell me they see you. They're good friends of mine. And I'll say, hey, I heard you see so-and-so. You're like, uh, no, I don't, I don't know what Just you're talking Just this about. last week, someone said, did you watch the wrestling? So I was there. He was like, you went to Kansas City? <laughs> yeah, I went to Kansas City. And he was like, do you, uh, uh, and he was like, 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 he was like startled. He had no idea. Like, yeah. he's like, oh, I, I knew you liked wrestling, but I didn't know. That I'm, guy doesn't have Instagram. He has no idea. <laughs> so I'm just like, he's older, he's retiree, but yeah. he has no idea the patients I'm working with. Mm-hmm. I was privately hired by an athlete to be there for five and a half days for him. The patient has no idea. He didn't even know I'm, I've been to the last three nationals. I've been to big tens. I've go to home duels. Like, I have a relationship with these guys where like they're coming to my house for dinner. Yeah. Like they're hanging out with my kids. Like, like you said, you're like sneaking them into your garage. It's just, it's, it's, I purposely enjoy my job. So I try to have as much fun as I can in the office. But when I leave the room, it's not like, Hey, guess what I just saw? Like it's, that's not the drive. So it's like, uh, people like I'll literally be in a room. I'll go into the next room and I'll see you. And you would have no idea who I just saw. Right. And it's none of your business because the pro- appointment is about you. Yeah. Not about the previous patient I just had. No. So, like, anything outside of that focus, I think is kind of rude. Yeah. Yeah, because, <laughs> you know, you see a lot of, you know, big name athletes, especially in this town. And never once have you come in and you go, hey, do you know who's in the next room? Oh, it's this guy. It's this big wrestler. I don't follow wrestling, so I wouldn't know who it was if you told me anyway. But that's just not the person you are. Like you said, you do it for the, the you're treating that person, not because of who, what they do or mm-hmm. who they are, which I think is awesome. Well, I'm glad I met you through it. Yeah, it worked out for me. <laughs> Keep fixing me up. Oh, the picture of you I have, you're supposed to sign it. I'm supposed to bring it. I'll be there tomorrow. I know, mine. Like I said, you're fixing my back tomorrow. Mm. <laughs> Let, let's look at some of chat GPT's questions, Ed. Uh, We already talked about that one. Only the good ones. If you weren't a chiropractor, what profession would you do? Oh, that's easy. Uh, Not easy, but I know. I would have gone special operations in the military and I would have chose medic. Oh, all right. Pretty simple. Carry a gun and save people's lives. You think about that, that you already had that queued up? Uh, No, but if I wasn't type 1 diabetic, I probably would have went that route. Oh, yeah. And they're like, hey, you can get a job at a debt. No, no, no. I'm not talking to you as a recruiter to get a job in uniform at a desk. No offense. Yeah. I'm not doing that. Right. I don't want to do that. Yeah. Some people do. Takes all kinds. No, I don't want to do that. That's not my drive. I would beat someone up over a stapler and some stupid signature I didn't have when I can grow a beard out and do some cool stuff somewhere else. Oh, yeah. There are... (laughs) When I say it takes all kinds, I went to a school. Um, it was a primary leadership development school. It's a school you go to to make sergeant. And I went at Fort Campbell when I was stationed there. And it's literally a lockdown school. Like you go there, you cannot leave. You're there for a month mm-hmm. and you sleep there, everything. And because Fort Campbell is such a big post, they bring in the, the people from other smaller posts that don't have that school. So we got all kinds of people. So we had, we had everything from infantry, like the dudes who were out there carrying rocks, shooting guns, whatever, to nurses at the hospital, to people who have literally never left like their radar thing where they just watch blips on a screen. Screen. And there was a guy in, in our class that he said to us on the first day, he said, uh, yeah, I'm pretty much allergic to every kind of insect bite there is. Um, here is my EpiPen. It's going to be right next to me and whoever I'm sitting next to needs to know how to use it. And if anything happens, just hammer me in the leg with it. And we're all like, screw you. How are you going to the <laughs> field? We have to go to the field for like four days at the end of this. 
and sleep in tents on the ground with insects. Yeah. How are you going to do that? He's like, Oh, I can't do that. And the, the instructor's like, Oh, you have to do that. Hmm. And legitimately that dude got, he, luckily for him, there was a nurse in our class because she went to go wake the dude up for guard duty and he's laying on the ground like drooling uh, and need no to get way. smacked with the EpiPen because he got bitten by something while he's sleeping on the ground. So wow. it takes all kinds. That guy worked in a in some sort of radar facility where he never, ever went to the field. Hmm. And it, it's it was very comical. The amount of people and I was just a helicopter guy. Like mm. I go to the field and we have big tents and we go fly somewhere else and get gas. We go get gas and then go get a shower. Uh, <laughs> no lie. I remember a couple of times I go, we were going on a flying mission while we were in the field and uh, the instructor pilot was like, Oh yeah. Hey, we're going to just fly back to the airfield and I'm going to do air quotes, blind cockpit drills with this pilot you go home and get a shower. Mm. Like, you're awesome. Yeah, that's Thank awesome. you. Yeah, after you've been in the field for a week with no shower and you haven't been to Burger King. Smell like a can of Pringles. <sighs> it's worse than that. <laughs> it's way worse than that. You go fly around with infantry guys that have been, you know, lugging a 100-pound ruck for a week. and you It's pick, not Old Spice. Oh, dude, you pick the <laughs> – I will never forget that smell. You put those dudes in there, and especially when it's in the winter – and you close the doors in that Black Hawk helicopter and there's like 11 infantry dudes in there that haven't showered in a week and have just been sweating all day. That is a smell you will not forget. Is it called fart? Oh, no, it's way worse. <laughs> it's way worse. I, it, it is indescribable, but if I smell it today, I'd be like, what? there's an infantry, there's a Black Hawk load of infantry Smelling dudes around here somewhere. It's, it's bad. It's real bad. Yeah. So... um so what, what sets you apart from other chiropractors around here? I mean, I think you already highlighted that. A lot of it. You, you know more than I do because you've seen other <laughs> chiropractors. So. Only one. But, but I've heard stories from other um, ones. I think that's a very subjective question for me because I can't quantify how to answer that. I just think I allow myself in my own business to be Eddie. Every day I want to go to work and I want to enjoy the staff I'm around, the building I'm in, the patients I'm seeing. I just want to be my the closest I could be to a genuine, authentic Eddie. And like people call me Dr. Ed and Dr. Camacho or whatever, but like inside between my two ears, I'm just Eddie. And I have an educational skill set that allows me to help you with something. That's it. And I don't want to overcomplicate situations, so I try to really think thoroughly of what I'm trying to handle or deal with. I'm a big believer of connecting with the patient. I think you have to build a relationship. It's, you know, if I don't know your last name, I probably can't help you because that means we've never spoke. And I think it's important for not someone to just look at a chart and be like, oh, this is uh, Jake's in his room. Cool. Hey, Jake. Like, you know nothing about them and then you're out before you even know anything about the person. So I always try to communicate. I, I talk a lot with my patients. Um, it sounds like my approach to a, treating a patient is different than what other people would expect. So when someone finds out I'm a chiropractor, they're like, oh, really? He's a chiropractor? But like, once they have that experience themselves, they realize chiropractors aren't all that bad. Like some of them are kind of cool. Some of them are pretty bad. Some of them smell weird. Some of them do some <laughs> corny stuff. Like everyone's different. There's so many. So it's like, I don't even get caught up in like what other people do. Right. I just be me. I drink my fancy coffee. I talk about it. I go do whatever the heck I want. I eat my food. like, And then it's just next patient. This is an opportunity for me to help someone. I take that pretty prideful. Like I really do enjoy helping people. And if I have an opportunity to help someone, I really want to help them. So every new patient that I see at the next appointment is a new chance, a new opportunity. It's like a sunrise. Every day it's a new chance, like a new day. Like Every patient's a new chance to fix this person. So my perspective, it's called practice because you never figure it out. Every day you're just practicing on the next patient. So every time I see you, I'm the best I'll, I've ever been because I'm always practicing all day, mm -hmm. every day. So that's just my mindset. It doesn't go anywhere. There's no perfection. There's no end point. It's just a process of getting better, learning, helping people, learning, making mistakes, learning, getting better, like over and over and over and over. And like, yeah, I've been doing this for a little bit. So some people say I'm good, which is fine, but I don't care. It's subjective, like whatever. Do you mean that progress is a process? Yeah, thanks for reading my sticker. <laughs> oh, I have that sticker. 
<laughs> it's in my gym on the whiteboard. I'll get you another one. Uh, but yeah, progress is a process. It's a corny line that I use a lot. Um, but it just, it's applicable for a lot of things in life. So like. It definitely is. You know, what, what makes me stand out? I don't know. I'm Eddie and you're not Eddie. So that's why I'm different than you. So what you're saying is when you, when you're hurting me, when I'm laying on your table and you say, you start asking me questions, you're really just trying to learn about me and you're not making me try to forget about the fact that your well, both. elbow is yeah. like knee deep into my shoulder like, blade or. Yeah. I, I want you to communicate <laughs> because I want you to breathe. But I also realized if you did nothing with your body and all you did was go food shopping and play bingo and go to church with your friends on like Sundays and Thursdays, your treatment would be very different. But you abuse your body mm-hmm. and you enjoy the things that hurt your body. So I don't I know have, if I enjoy it, well, but I keep doing it. <laughs> you've repetitively done it for more than one year. Yep. So I think I have to match that intensity and realize this person is going to leave my office and wake up tomorrow morning and beat the crap out of himself at five o'clock in the morning. And then the following days to do it again. And the following days to do it again. And on the weekends, they have a shooting competition. And then in a month, he's going to have a tactical games whole weekend. Like that's your, that's what you're doing. So if someone doesn't meet your body's needs and how you're actually using your body, it's like in a mechanic. If I take my car for an oil change down the street at Jiffy Lube and I'm actually street racing a Ferrari, you, you, can't, you can't tune up my vehicle. You don't know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. You can change the oil for a Honda Civic and that's about it, buddy. So like, if you're treating your body like a Ferrari and you're running it like a Ferrari, then I have to be a Ferrari to also address what you need. And if you're running your car like a Toyota Corolla, that's 25 years old and you barely use it and your seatbelt is uncreased and there's no bucket impression of your butt in the driver's seat and you never use the vehicle, I have to be way more gentle with you. But you bring me things that I have to address that there's always a story of how it happened and then there's always a process of what you're going to do when you leave my office, whether it's work-related, training-related, competition-related, or building a new studio related there's something that you're doing with your body that it's like crap i need to fix this with mark because he's gonna go ham this weekend <laughs> so i have to do things and is it uncomfortable at times yeah i don't care you're paying me to help you oh, you yeah. ask me to do something yeah. without having any discomfort you said can you help me with my back and i said yes <laughs> and i i also probably shouldn't tell you this but now it's become a competition between steph and i because she's told me that she's had to tap out before she has one I, time yeah i'm not keeping score but she has and i'm like i'm never doing that <laughs> i'm never doing that so now i'm afraid that no, i've told good. you that you're, you're gonna, gonna be like oh you're never doing it no my my job is not to make you submit it's not watch jiu-jitsu. me bro it's not jujitsu <laughs> but if you can handle breathing and you know how to breathe and when to breathe nothing's ever going to hurt you too bad like yeah. Navy SEALs get through a lot of crazy stuff and they're taught how to breathe. Sure. Like it's pain the whole time. Yeah. But you mitigate that pain by learning how to breathe and changing your focus to something different. So I talk to patients about, hey, what's your day like? How was Easter? Yeah. Hey, did you fix your car? Like, you know, did you build a new gun? Like, let's like, let's just change the topic and not think about my elbow in your shoulder for the next 30 seconds. Well, it's always so funny too, because you always start to, hey, well, what's the rest of your day? Like you try to be all calm. Like, I know what you're doing. <laughs> It's fine. I know what you're up to. It's fine. Um, so, but outside of that, you also do like a lot of like more high tech type stuff than what I think other chiropractor doctors and I have are some doing. cool toys. Yeah, yeah, like I see some of the stuff you post on Instagram that you're doing with some of the athletes with hand eye coordination stuff mm-hmm. and like really thinking about stuff rather than like I think a lot of a lot of people in your industry, it's like. 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. It's just churn to get through. If you're stuck in that time process where you have to see a patient to pay your bills every 10 to 15 minutes, you don't have much opportunity Hmm. because the insurance game is not lucrative. You're controlled on what you can do. You're controlled on what services they can pay for. You're controlled in the time you can do a certain therapy for. Like there's so many parameters. So when I'm spending more time with a patient and I'm not pursuing the insurance route for that case, I can be a little nerdy Eddie and like let my little clinical brain just go free. And it's like, okay, cool. Like you are a soccer player. You don't have a good peripheral vision. You need to see the field because you play defense and you need to get the ball out to a midfielder, an offensive person quickly because the other team is trying to score. 
If you can't see the field because your vision sucks on right side for a 20 degree range of arc, then you're not going to see 60, 70 yards, maybe 50 feet down the street, down the field. So my brain knowing that, it's like, okay, I know your position. I know what you need to do. You can't see peripherally really well out of this one eye. So we need to drill that. Oh, you can see white and red, but you can't see green. Well, that's a problem because there's a couple schools that wear green jerseys. And if you can't <laughs> see a person that's yeah. there, that's an intercepted pass. So can you see blue? Can you see green? Can you see white? Can you see red? At what distance? At what parameter? At, like, there's a lot of things to look at, but you can't do that in a short window. So like, you know, we joke in chiropractic school, there's wham, bam, thank you, ma'ams. Like, those are the short chiropractors that you go in, they're in and out. Like, it's wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Go pay on the, on the way out. Like, I don't want to do that. There's too many of them. How am I going to stand out? By not doing that. That was why I left the last guy I went Do to. anything. Because that's what it was. Do anything but that and you'll stand yeah. out. So it's just like, okay, what makes Eddie most happy? What is Eddie most trained and capable of doing? Well, people that are very motivated in a certain task and treat their body like a machine – I could probably help you. I've done it. Been there. I'm now retired, and I'm having a great time being on the clinical side of doing things. So, you know, whatever. You're really good at being a nerd. I love being a nerd. And I say that in like the, in the I love you way of, mm -hmm. I think that's what you're really good at. I, I used to be very... Uh, and I love when people nerd out on stuff. Because I do it. Like, I, I mean... I have I have my things that I nerd out on, and I have a lot of respect for my people who do the same thing. My question for you: Can anyone be a professional if they're not nerdy in their field? I don't think so. Exactly. No, like if you're not if you're not getting into the absolute bottom of the the nerdiest things out there, like you're not going to be the best at it. You'll you might be a really good amateur at it. Um, you know, you, you got to learn every little nuance that you possibly can and every day, it. even in real estate. Like I tell people all the time, like I learn something new every day mm -hmm. and I'm not kidding. Like every day and whether it's from some goofy real estate Facebook group that I'm in that someone says something stupid and I'm like, that doesn't make sense. I have to go look this up mm -hmm. or something new that comes out and I'm like, oh, I have to look this up or, you know, whatever it is that just getting down and learning something new every day and drilling down into to nerdy stuff is you have to, if you want to be really good at what I you used, do. I was the student in school that was busy in athletics. I was in all the honors classes and I never raised my hand because I felt like if I said the wrong answer, 90% of the room would say, Oh, that dumb jock, that stupid kid. And they just go back to playing football or wrestling or whatever. So I was always like super anxious of like getting the answer wrong. So I just stay quiet. And like, wasn't a great student, didn't do homework, like didn't bring backpacks home, like just wanted to play sports and hang out with friends. And teacher would ask a question and I, in my head, I'd be like, uh, this is the answer. And then I would wait, let's see if that's the answer. Um, and someone else would be like, oh, it's this answer. And I'm like, oh, sweet. I got that. Like, I knew that. And then when it comes time for tests, I wouldn't study for tests. Like, I don't, and this is not the healthiest way to approach education, but this is the way I did it was a test was how much do you know? And in my brain was how much do you remember? So give me the test. I didn't, I'm not looking at any notes. I didn't take notes. So like I'm very visual. I just watched and I would watch a teacher. I'd not watch a teacher. I'd watch a teacher. I'd not watch a teacher. How much did you remember from this last unit, whatever chapter? And we get the test and I passed and I did pretty good because obviously I'm a physician now. So I did that for a lot of years. Um, my ability to study and retain information, pretty poor. Cause it's just not how I learn, but I was always this quiet, nerdy kid that was so scared of one, letting people know I had glasses or had contacts. Cause I just, you know, the cliche, Oh, you're a nerdy glasses. Yeah, I am like, whatever. Um, I mean, being like fascinated by history, by documentaries, by podcasts, my wife's like, do you ever turn off? No, I don't. Why? Like, why would I watch some fiction, stupid movie about something that's not interesting? When I can watch a documentary on World War II and learn all this and cool learn stuff something. about Croatia, yeah. my wife's like, you're weird. I'm like, I don't care. So I used to like really be like subconscious about it. Now I don't care. Yeah, I'm nerdy as hell. And I know a lot about a couple things. And if you want to talk about it, let's talk. If you talk to me about something else, we have like some really dry humor. Stepbrothers, I probably fell asleep seven times trying to watch the movie. <laughs> like, it, like the elf. I love that movie. What's but... the um, Will Ferrell, the elf one? Is it called Elf? Elf. Yeah, I fall asleep all the time. My wife loves it. Like, 
I just there's certain movies I just can't dive into these entertainment traps where like there's not a lesson right there's not a learning opportunity it's like I don't have a lot of time to be helping everyone in the world so if I am not doing something to learn because tomorrow someone's going to ask me for help if I don't have the answer or direction to find the answer I feel like I failed them so it's like I have this I have a title I have a physician license and title where people call me doctor every day so they think I have all the answers I don't so I have like this well, you got to learn more, Ed. You got to learn more. You got to learn more. And like, it used to be a negative. Now, I'm like, oh, this is kind of, kind of dope. I know a lot of stuff. So it's kind of fun now. But for the last, you know, 20 years of my life, I'd hide behind my nerdiness. And like, I, I thought it was weird to know stuff. I thought it was weird to have the answer. I thought it was weird to retain information. Now it's not weird. Yeah. The older you get, you're like, I'm way cooler because I know a lot of stuff. Jenna's like, how do you remember everything? I don't know. I just remember it. Yeah. Like, I learned it. Now right. I know it. Because you're, I'm very much the same way. I see things and it, it, I just remember it. Like I didn't study a lot during college either. I didn't study a lot in, well, high school I almost failed out of, just because I, I didn't like it and I was misdirected. And the army is what directed me the right way. So then when I got out of the army, I, my first semester at Penn State was a 4.0. Like I graduated with honors, because I just. At that point, I was like, oh, like if you just apply yourself, like you can do really well. Mm -hmm. When I was in high school, I was like, "Mm, I just don't really want to be here. So I didn't do well. And my recruiter would just say to me, my mom eventually told my recruiter, look, he's your problem now. I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm done worrying about him. You need to get him to graduate because if he doesn't graduate, he can't go in the army. So he's your problem. Mm -hmm. So he'd sit down with me and look at my report card and go, "Uh, let's see, you got this uh, English. You need that to graduate? Yeah, I do. Well, you better get your shit together because you're about to fail it. Mm. What about this one? Physics? You need that to graduate? I'm like, nah. He goes, all right, well, don't worry about that. <laughs> like, and it was, you know, that was just how it worked. But uh, then when I, I got out, I'm like, okay. I, and I did really well in the Army. I, that was where I learned, like, if you really apply yourself, it's rewarding. Mm-hmm. Like, it's rewarding personally, and, it's re- and it can be rewarding professionally. Mm-hmm. So... I did really well. I got promoted quickly. And then that carried over to when I got out and like, I can do 20 credit semesters and mm-hmm. do really well in this. And like college, I thought was easy. My ability, my ability to retain information, I think is, um, better than some people give me credit for. I, like just historically, um, teachers, parents, whatever, like friends. I, I, athletic training. Awesome. I was, I was super focused. I could tell you every bone, where it is, how to touch it, how to move it, like what nerve made it move. Like it was just so interesting to me that like it was absorbed. Went to chiropractic school. Once again, always feeling I was the dumb kid in the smart classes. I go to chiropractic school and they're like, oh, ask Eddie, ask Eddie. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the idiot here. Like what? And then I started realizing I'm not the idiot here. Maybe where I was before. But where I am now, I'm not the idiot anymore. And then I started realizing people were, hey, what do you, how do you do this? How do you treat that? And like, oh, like give that case to Eddie. Like he knows knees really well. And I'm like, holy crap. So like all of these experiences kind of just compound on himself where it's like I was forced to learn stuff in school between, before the 12th grade and stuff I didn't care about. I got to college. I was like, oh, I could pick a class? Yep. I love space. Oh, I can take a class on space and in. I learned all this stuff about space. You know, sports medicine, human anatomy, like absorbed and for some reason it's just once it's there it's not going anywhere and i'm grateful for that i know that that can change as you age and like people do forget things but like while i have the capacity to do so i'm gonna hustle as long as i can Mm -hmm. because like i have the ability to access a ton of information accurately efficiently in a very timely manner all day every day and that excites me so that's part of my business model is Get nerdy, learn a bunch of stuff, and then use all the data you have to help a person with a problem. Well, and Steph gets so annoyed with me because the pretty much the only thing I watch on TV is YouTube. <laughs> like, I have YouTube hooked up to my TV in the living room, and that is pretty much the only thing I watch. And I watch just because it's, it's learning something. Like, mm-hmm. I don't, I guess there probably is fiction stuff mm-hmm. on YouTube. I don't know. But I watch stuff that I think is neat. Like I, I've watched people build 
freaking U U haul trucks into mm-hmm. campers and just you name it, weird stuff. Like, you know, I, I went on there and watched. I don't watch wrestling. And I don't watch UFC, but I watch Bo Nichols podcast because you were on it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, That's I want to awesome. learn more about Ed. I want to see. Awesome. I want to see what they talk about and. uh and it was super cool, and, and that's just. And now I end up watching his freaking podcast all the time because mm. it's he's an interesting dude. Um, There's a lot of cool people. Yeah, and and like I just want to just keep learning and keep learning and keep learning as long as my brain will still accept stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think you're a lot the same way. I mean, probably why we get along. Yeah, it because probably is. I, I I don't have tolerance for people that are not self motivated learners. Yeah, I, I just don't have the tolerance, so I, I can't talk to certain people in my family. I can't talk to certain people in my office. Like, like patient wise, like it's very cut and dry. Like, hey, how you doing? Okay, cool. Everything's doing well. Okay, cool. See you later. Sure. Because like, I can't interact. Like, it's they're, like yeah, there are people you want to spend time with. I have so, people in my family like that. Yeah. It's like they're still in the exact same place that they were thirty years ago because they go home at night, they sit there and they watch four hours of fictionalized television, yeah, yeah, probably yeah. mainstream media news where they're fed whatever the thing is today. And that's it. And then it's rinse and repeat every single day and mm-hmm. nothing ever changes. And if nothing ever changes, there's nothing no ever changes. There's no growth. So uh, there's just people I can't spend time with. Mm-hmm. I, I like spending time with people like you. who, <laughs> Like we have similar levels of intensity and, you know, I, you're probably a lot like me that even though we're people tell us we're moving at a million miles an hour, it's you enough. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You probably feel the same way I do. Like, oh, I'm so lazy. On my way here, Jenna was like, you have all these things going on. You're here, you're here, you're traveling here, you're flying here. And my brain is like, I mean, got to keep the ball rolling. Like, like yeah. in my brain, like, it, it, it's not enough. Like, I, I have more to do still. So it's Yeah, like, most it, days it I feel like, oh, I'm stop. lazy. Why am I so lazy? Mm-hmm. And people are like, you, you're doing a podcast, you're running a business, you have like five, you have a mortgage company, you have this, you have this, you have this. I'm like, yeah, but like, I, I just feel like I didn't get anything done today. Like I, I feel lazy. I feel like I didn't do anything. Like it's just, and it's part of it's imposter syndrome type stuff. And part of it's just like, I feel like there's always more to do and there's always more stuff I can do. I, my, I know my drive is from, I lost a good friend at 16. It was like the first like actual death that like emotionally affected me. And I've lost more friends since then. Mm-hmm. But 16 years old, Christmas Eve, someone passed away, a uh, pretty traumatic situation. And that was the hourglass that was turned upside down in my brain where I realized this kid didn't go to junior prom, didn't go to formal or senior for, uh, senior prom, junior formal, didn't have a senior, didn't graduate high school, didn't go to college, didn't get married, didn't have kids, like, didn't, like nothing. It just stops. And that impacted me. I was 16 years old. It changed my life. And I was very shy. I was very timid. And I'm still, I'm a little, I guess, reserved until I get to know you. But I used to be extremely shy. I wouldn't even talk to people. And when, and it's just a great quote that I, I, I've said a couple of times when I've done um, guest lectures on, on campus for different classes. But like, things change when your friends start dying. And like, that's something that has always been a, a, a constant in my life. Every time I look backwards and I try to be introspective and learn, one person passed away. I realize you can lose everything in an instant and then it's done. Your legacy's over. Everything you've done is just stops. It's the end, period. And you don't know when it's going to happen. You don't know any data. You don't like you can't project certain things, if, especially if it's traumatic. If you have a, a diagnosis and there's like a countdown, like, that's different. But I've lost a, more than one person at a young age where by the time I was 20, I've lost a handful of people. And by the time I was 30, I lost a lot of people. And it's almost not healthy, but it also created a lot of perspective for me where you don't have time. Like time is like this fake illusion of like, oh, we have time. No, you you don't have time for crap. Mm -hmm. I wanted to write a book because I just wanted to prove to myself I could. So I did it just because, like just because I wanted to do something. And what what was I going to wait for? An invitation in the mail? Like no one's going to send me a social media DM. Hey, Ed, you should write a book today starting now about like, it doesn't happen. Right. So if there's something you want to do, just do it now. That's it. And when you do that earlier in your career, people are like, wow, you've done so much. And like, why are you so motivated? Well, well, if you've lived my life, you'd understand a little bit. If we had a cup of coffee and we've talked pretty deeply on some painful subjects, you'd probably see me get emotional and you would understand exactly 
why I get up with this much energy every day. So it's like, you don't have time. I'm not going to sit on my couch and waste four hours on my phone scrolling on Facebook. I'm not doing it ever, ever, ever. I'm not doing that. I, I, I physically cannot do it. My brain will not allow me. I'll be there for 20 minutes. I will get internally angry at myself where I'm like, Eddie, you got to stop freaking doing this. Stop. Do, do something else. Put your phone down. And it's like, all right, open up a text. Hey, do you need an appointment tomorrow? Hey, what's going on? Did you finish? Like, what can I do to produce some sort of outcome or gain in education, experience, intelligence, like w- opportunity? Like, do something. Because doing nothing is not getting you anywhere. And if you don't have a lot of time and you don't know when your end date is, what are you waiting for? Yeah. What are you waiting for? Because like you said it, or like we said earlier, remember you must die. Mm-hmm. So don't wait on stuff. Just get it done. Go. Just go do it. Like, and like I rather, I rather try and fail than never try and wonder period. Mm-hmm. Always. Like I, I literally, and fe- sometimes fear gets the best of, of people, but like failure sometimes scares people even more. And like some people are more scared of failing than they are of fear itself. So well, you should have fear. Like, that's normal. That's a normal sure, response. Healthy. Yeah. But, like, what you do, do you sit down or do you stand up? Like, that, that's, an action, that's an actionable choice. So, you got scared. Great. What did you do next? Like, that is where I want to stand out. Right. And Because I, some of it's just irrational. It's a thought. You know, like, <laughs> like, like it was Saxton and I were talking last week that, you know, he, he rides a BMX bike. And flips. Like, some of the things he does... <laughs> can and have i'm sure Hurt get people. him complete very injured mm-hmm. like jumping over stuff but then he talked about doing stand-up comedy like yeah you could be very afraid of that mm-hmm. but really what's the worst thing's going to happen like you're not going to break your leg you're not going to get catapulted 30 feet in the air and come crashing down yeah someone might go boo mm-hmm. and you might feel bad about you know what else is uncomfortable minute. doing 40 push-ups in a row yeah like but that it's still uncomfortable. And you won't die. Pick it. Pick More what than you likely. Want. You're not going to die doing stand-up comedy. No. You're not going to die doing 40 push-ups. So like both are discomfort. Both are a little, you know, oh, this is going to make me feel uncomfortable and weird. But that's the point of growth. Yeah. If you don't feel that regularly, what are you doing? You're staying stagnant. But stagnant, that means you're not growing. And I'm a big believer that nothing is flatline because flatline is death. So it's either <laughs> up or down. Yeah. Stock market, flat, the stock market never just goes horizontal. No. It's always up or down. Every second, it's up or down. When you're in a hospital and you're hooked up to a heart monitor, it's up or down. So nothing is flatlined. So if you're not doing something to go up, you're automatically, by design and gravity, going down. So That's pick a, weird pick a choice. It. Yeah. I'm weird. Whatever. It's cool. You're weird. But I like you for that. <laughs> so let's talk about your other nerd ha- hobby, uh, coffee. Tell me, tell So I heard the story of your how you got into coffee on Bo Nichols' podcast, but... For our listeners, yeah, uh, how did you get into coffee, and like um, re- real into coffee? So one, I'm a nerd. So two, I need to know everything about everything just because I want to. I'm curious. Uh, my wife read a book, and basically, type one diabetics or type two diabetics could develop Alzheimer's or dementia at a faster rate based on blood sugar irregulation. And there's a lot of research around black coffee consumption of three to five cups a day that can reduce those effects of developing neurogenic or neurological diseases later in life, especially those who have blood sugar issues like diabetes. So my wife comes around and says, hey, I just read this, blah, blah, blah. You're not drinking enough coffee. I said, what? (laughs) And I was just drinking like the... Normal, like one cup a day, Spanish coffee that my grandma bought. Just and she's like, those are rookie numbers. You got to bump them up. Yeah. And uh, then we were living somewhere else. We were in Jersey at the time. We, she, we came to State College to visit her family. And we went to this coffee shop called Rothrock. And I'm a big BMX fan. So like, you know, oh my God, Jamie Bestwick. Oh my God, Ronnie. Like, it's like, oh my God, these guys like own this place. And they're like, coffee, let's go there. So we went there. I go to the counter. I go to look at the counter. And I'm like, um... The word coffee is not on the menu. <laughs> like, All this is in Italian. It what are they doing? Yeah, and I'm like, wait a second. Like, I know we're in a coffee shop. I'm already a physician, so I know I'm not stupid. Some of these words, I don't even know what they mean. I don't know what it is, and I don't even know where to find the word coffee just to see how much it is to get a cup of coffee. Like, what do I say? So it was very internalized stress. So I was like, this makes me uncomfortable. Like, I don't like this. I know I'm educated, and I feel really stupid right now. So... 
I just said, I want a cup of coffee. And he's like, well, how? Like, drip? And I'm like, what the hell is a drip? <laughs> like, I had no idea anything. And he's like, well, this is an AeroPress. This is an espresso latte, blah, blah. And I was like, um. And, like, he pointed at this thing. I was like, yeah, I guess that. And he's like, all right, cool. He's like, blah, blah, He rang me up. And he gave me this cup of coffee, you know, four or five minutes later. And I drank it. I was like, what is this dark liquid? Like, it tasted amazing. And I thought all I knew was I ordered some sort of coffee. This guy made it for me in this device. And it is the most delicious cup of coffee I've ever had in my life. Because I've never had anything that was actually good. And I'm like, all right, I need to buy that. Were you drinking Keurig before that? No, hell no. <laughs> no. I was using a drip machine, which I didn't know what it was. I just thought it was a coffee pot. Right. It's a coffee maker. I didn't know it was called drip coffee. Like, why? Why? Well, because it drips in. Well, okay. That all right. Makes well, sense. that makes sense. But like, I didn't now understand I that. Um, I only knew one way of coffee. Like, I only knew, like, a coffee machine makes coffee. And then an espresso machine made an espresso. Like, I didn't know there was all, like, these concoctions that you can brew and make and different devices. Like, I didn't know that existed. So, you know, I feel uncomfortable. I feel, I, I know I'm smart, but I feel stupid. I get coffee. It tastes great. And I'm like, I want to replicate that. And once my wife hit me with that fact that you're not drinking enough coffee, and because I'm educated and spent a decent amount of money learning, losing my mind or not being able to think is a massive fear. It was, it was a big fear. Now it's not a fear so much. Um, but knowing that's a possibility of waking up one day and not really remembering your name, your kid's name, your grandkid's name, information, like why, where you put stuff, like that was a worry. That was a concern of mine, you know, maybe 10 years ago. And my wife was like, well, if you want, I think the book was called Grain Brain. If you want to have a healthier brain, you have to drink more coffee because you have a blood sugar issue. <laughs> Game on. So I started drinking more coffee and then I like, tasting bad coffee and good coffee and then there are different ways to make coffee and like i just realized i don't know if this is healthy because too much of anything is never enough it's never good so let's 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 look to the research so i started looking up all these research articles and finding like actual research from like europe and gosh asia us like all this stuff on caffeine black coffee consumption health benefits organ effects cortisol changes hormonal like sleep like everything i was looking at all this i'm like is coffee good for me? Because at the time I was still competing in, in weightlifting and powerlifting, or sorry, weightlifting. Um, so I was like, is this even good for my body? I understand like it's okay for your brain if you're diabetic. It's helpful to avoid certain things in the future. But like, is this good? Is it going to make my heart explode? Yeah, like, or if, am, I, am I poisoning myself? Like, like, I had no idea. So I dove into all this research and my little nerdy self was like, oh my God, after five pages of typing this blog post about is coffee good or bad, the argument. And I wrote this whole long five page blog post on like the benefits of coffee and why it's good for you and how to drink it and how to consume it and how to roast it. And the antioxidant capacity of like certain beans from certain altitudes from certain countries roasted a certain way are actually really healthy for you. So it's like, okay, now I have the blueprint. If I want to have coffee as a health beverage, you can't abuse it. You have to stay under your caffeine limit in a day based on your kilogram body weight. And you should probably drink stuff that are has naturally higher antioxidants that were not burnt in the roasting process and maintain that health purity substance in a cup. So you can drink a black cup of coffee and have a ton of antioxidants, more than blueberries. And blueberries are pretty high. So once I learned all the parameters of the type of bean, where it's grown, how it's grown, how it's dried, how it's roasted, how it's ground, how it's brewed, the temperature it's at, all to make me a cup of coffee, to have a health benefit, I'm just going to do that. And it turns out that actually tastes pretty damn good. So <laughs> There's that benefit there too. There you go. Um, so wait, there's an upper limit on yes, how much caffeine yes, I'm supposed to have? Yes. What is it? Um, for me, it's 400. I don't know what for you, but there's an equation. Like there's a caffeine limit equation that you have to put in your body weight in kilograms. And it'll give you exactly how much milligrams of caffeine would be your upper limit threshold in a day. Now, how much do you weigh? Uh, 175. Oh, then we're the same. Okay, cool. So there's Shit. slow metabolizers. <laughs> there's slow metabolizers and there's fast metabolizers. A slow metabolizer drinks caffeine in the morning and they're screwed for the next 12 hours. A fast metabolizer drinks a shot of espresso and they fall asleep in an hour. I realized I was a fast metabolizer. So I can have a cup of coffee in the morning. Yeah. I can have an, another cup of coffee at lunchtime or an energy drink in the afternoon or a pre-workout. And I'm still under my 400 threshold. I sleep like a baby. 
I have wonderful sleep and I wake up ready to tackle the day. If I was a slow metabolizer like my wife, have a cup of coffee, I'm screwed for the day. Yeah, my pre-workout is 325. Yeah, most pre-workouts <laughs> are pretty dangerous. Um, most energy drinks are like 200 milligrams per, yeah. per can. So like, you know, if you have two of those in a day, you're, depending on your weight and your metabolism, you're probably pushing your limit. And when you go over your limit of caffeine threshold, your adrenal glands don't like that. Your cortisol hormone gets pumped out too much. It fatigues the adrenals. Adrenals create a lot of your sex hormones. So then you start having issues with sleep, with sex production or sex hormone production, um, you know, energy production, focus, like anxiety. Like there's a lot of stuff that goes on with too much caffeine. So once you learn your threshold, I don't like the jitters. I don't get the jitters, but I also don't drink a lot of coffee. I just drink really good coffee to start my day, period. I have a friend that I do tactical games with, Bill. Bill is just ridiculous. He has like a constant caffeine drip all day. He drinks pre-workout while he's going to bed. It. Like, you know, Mountain Ops has a uh, a subscription mm -hmm. that you can get it delivered to your house. He has to get two. That's not good. Because <laughs> for your heart and for your body to produce hormones and for your brain to get rest, that's not good. He he is an interesting dude. Uh, he your uh, body will adapt, but only for so long. Yeah, Bill Hostler. He's a sorry, Bill, but you should probably cut back. <laughs> Bill will probably find out about this podcast and then he will send a, send me a message to pass on to you and it will be very funny. That's fine. It will be obscene, mm -hmm. but it will be very That's funny. Fine. He probably will say, I'm never effing stopping drinking, which is fine. I'm not saying oh, stop he caffeine. Won't. I don't think he could. I don't, I'm not saying stop. I just reduce. I think it's what keeps his heart going. That's dangerous. <laughs> he, he's, he is an amazing dude though. Uh, just constant caffeine. He goes to tactical games with us, and I think when we go out to dinner, he orders everything on the menu. We we were went to this Italian restaurant, and that dude was like, "Yeah, give me the garlic knots, give me this, give me this, give me that." They just kept bringing him food, and he just kept crushing it. I don't know how that we the one other time the year before we went to uh, like a Longhorn Steakhouse or something, and he was just crushing absurd amounts of food, and he's not a big dude. Like he's, he's, I think he's probably lighter than me, but just obscene amounts of food. Do you think there's a relation with caffeine? I have no idea. That dude's metabolism runs like a gerbil, I think. Well, I can, <laughs> this is kind of funny, but it's sad. Uh, an entire pizza is my serving size. And when I started dating my wife, she would like have like one or two slices. And like my brain was like, Oh crap! I only get six. Like, <laughs> like, like the fact that that was a negative sensation yeah. in my body of like, oh my god, you only get six slices of pizza. I, I had to like really like Eddie stop. Yeah. And then I realized, you know, if you just order two pizzas, you get all of the topping you want, and she can get what she wants. And then you'll get the leftover of that exactly. too. So we now we order two pizzas, and that's why you're married. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that was a food is not a problem. No, food is not a problem. And I think. Outside of uh, Rothrock Coffee, you're the only person I know that roasts his own coffee beans, too. I didn't know that was a thing. Like, that was a part of the hobby of you just roast your own beans. I mean, some people buy rifles and some people build rifles. Uh, I guess that's true. I didn't know people build rifles. You, and so I, I met you. I didn't know people <laughs> built coffee. Uh, I remember I asked you one time about, uh, hey, I think I'm going to get an espresso machine. And in typical fashion, I got like this four page long email of you could get this one or you could get this, but then you need this. It was grinder, too much for a text. And then you need this <laughs> and then you need this. It was like a, a school report. With links. Oh yeah. With links. <laughs> I own one of them already and it's great. Like yeah. it works perfectly. But then I say things to you like, Hey, well, you know, I just don't get this result out of it. And you're like, look, man, you're, you're you're not really working with a Ferrari here. You're kind of working with uh, maybe a Mustang. So you get, that's the kind of quality you get out of it. You're doing okay, but you know, it's no Ferrari. Yeah. Like, all right. There's levels. Yeah. There's, there's levels. There's definitely there's levels. levels. I think I can shoot a firearm. I go around you. I see your gun and I'm like, okay, there's levels to this. And then I see you operate your gun. And you're like, Hey, Ed, you want to shoot my gun? I'm like, sure. And then I shoot it and I watch you shoot. I'm like, oh, there's, there's levels levels to everything oh yeah and when you don't know you don't know yeah so i didn't know 
Oh, yeah. I've introduced you to another world of coffee. You've introduced me to another world of firearms. Yep. And I think that's been a healthy exchange for us. That was like uh, when I first started shooting, it was two gun then, now three gun. But um, we were just doing it up at the club. And, you know, it was, I had no idea what I was doing. And I think I was shooting a pump shotgun with no choke in it and was loading shotgun shells out of my pocket. Mm -hmm. And my buddy Eric Scott showed up to a match and that was the first time I ever saw someone quad load and I watched him put that thing on his shoulder and start jamming shotgun shells into it like eight shotgun shells in four minutes four seconds and I'm like what is that (laughs) what just happened right there what what sort of voodoo is he doing right there and it's like like you said there's levels to it Mm -hmm. first when I used to race motorcycles I uh we thought we were all fast riding on the street and state college center county type people and uh, my friend Ryan Minotti and I went to the track and then you found out who was actually fast. Mm-hmm. You're like, oh, you thought you were fast? You were nothing compared to that guy. Mm-hmm. And just same with shooting. I go to some of these matches and it's like, I'm not going to be that guy. I would like to. I learned a lot from a bunch of my friends like that. But man, there's definitely levels oh, to it. When I was a senior Penn State, I was decently strong. One of the girls in my class was like on the powerlifting team. She was like, hey, you should try. You should come by. Like we have a club. It lifts all like whatever day of the week, whatever. Um, you should come by because you know, I think, you know, she found out or I think she saw me or heard that I lifted a decent amount of weight in the gym. And she said, you should come check out the powerlifting club. I was like, yeah, cool. So I showed up one day. I reached out to the president, vice president. I go to Shelly. I walk in. The first thing I do when I walk in is I just walk straight in this gym. And there's a kid who's probably half my size lifting the weight i just did that week which was a massive pr for me and this kid's 132 pound power lifter lifting over 400 pounds and i think i just squatted 400 we're all like i'm a beast and i'm like <laughs> i'm 168 169 pounds maybe 170 i squat 405 decent but then i just watched a dude 30 pounds less than me smoke it out of a rack and i'm like oh hell no and i just sat there i didn't touch anything i just sat and i watched a girl putting like 350 on the bar. I'm thinking, one, she's a girl. Not that girls are weak, but I never seen a girl that was strong physically, in person. Yeah. And I just saw her unrack, squat, and I'm like, oh my God, who are these animals? And I realized I was training in the wrong environment. I was good for my environment. I went to a new environment, and being in that group of individuals just massively leveled me oh up. Oh my gosh, that is the it's a game changer. That is the biggest, I think, lesson in life is you. <laughs> To quote Louis Simmons, mm-hmm. if you if you uh, walk with the lame, you develop a limp. Mm-hmm. And when I was shooting three gun, when I started, I would only shot my little club around here. Mm-hmm. Never left, never went and shot anything else. And then Pierre Leclerc said mm-hmm. to me one time, "Oh, you got to go shoot this other match with me." So we went to Antolani over near Hazelton, and I shot a match over there and. It was like two and a half hours away. I'm like, oh man, it's so far. And then it was like, all right, well, that's relative. So if I'm going to go two and a half hours there, I'll go two and a half hours to York where there are dudes down there that were literally on the three gun nation, like us tour, or like they were on TV, like buddy night, man. I watched that dude on, on television. And now he's like shooting at the same club mm-hmm. and eventually wound up being a good friend of mine. And, taught me a ton about not only shooting, but like running matches and things to look for. just learned a lot from that guy. But some of those guys that I would sit there and look at in awe, mm-hmm. uh, when I go to a match, then I'm like, I have to squad with those guys. Yeah. I have to squad with those guys. And, and that sport is so great because the people in it are so great. They're like, they will, they'll just teach you. Like, even though they're a competitor, they're competing against you. They're, if you ask them a question, Hey man, why did you do that? Mm-hmm. Like I asked my friend Andy that all the time. I'm like, Andy, why did you do it that way? And he's like, Oh, well, it's because of this, this, and this, and this. And now mm-hmm. it's to the point where like the guys that I looked at when I started in this thing, and yesterday I sent a message to to those guys. Yesterday was the eight year anniversary of my first three gun match. Mm-hmm. And so those guys like Garrett Boop, Andy Snyder, Kevin Nidell, they were dudes that I was watching from afar, like, oh my dudes are amazing they're so fast they're so good that i finally like got the courage to squad with them for a match now we're freaking best friends Mm -hmm. like they were we're all texting each other today silly memes like andy's texting andy's a 
uh, police officer, or paramedic, flight paramedic, all kinds of stuff. He texts us all this stuff about like, hey, someone found an ear in the grass <laughs> in Philadelphia, a severed ear. Bet you guys never saw that before. <laughs> well, like, yeah, you're right. But <laughs> happy, like, happy Thursday. <laughs> yeah, like people that I'm like were my heroes. I now get to talk to every day. And it, but my shooting ability went up so quickly when I started shooting with those guys. Environment's crucial. Yeah, ex- exactly. Mm-hmm. And it's like people share things, and it's like all those little things that you pick up along the way mm-hmm. makes it just just levels you up and it shortens your learning curve. Like if you had to go learn those things on your own, it would take you much longer. Mm -hmm. But when you have, have people like those guys and like Kevin Downing and the other people that I've learned so much from, it just, it shortens your learning curve. And if you help those people out, it it goes both ways. Like everybody, uh, rising tide lifts all the ships. Teamwork brings, teamwork brings the dream work. That's right. I said in the office, I said at home, I said all the time, like you work with others, they're going to make your dreams come true. Right. I said it in my office too, like mm-hmm. in my own office in the real estate business, like I tell the agents in my office, like I will share anything with you. I will tell you exactly how I do anything. Like right before you came over, another agent from our office called me and was like, Hey, how would you handle this? How do you do this? Like we're, com- we're technically competitors. Mm-hmm. Like that person and myself could be competing for the same listing, but I don't care. Like I'll tell them exactly how I do everything because mm-hmm. It makes all of us better. Yeah. Like, and, and I, you know, if we all did that, the world would be a much better place. It's not that easy, buddy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, I, I know you have to get out of here. Yeah, you got to get home. Put your kids to bed. Put your kids to bed. So. One of them. Thanks for being yeah. here. Summit Chiropractic. If you need to get fixed up, you definitely got to go see Eddie. Or you just need a motivational speaker. If you me. need a motivational speaker, <laughs> he does that too. Summit Chiropractic. Uh, he's on Instagram. He's always got great stuff on uh, on the gram. I see him on there every day. We trade stuff back and forth all the time. But you also get to see a little snapshot of Eddie's life and see all the cool stuff he does with all the cool people that he hangs out with. I'm just a kid named Eddie from Jersey. That from a big Jersey. Dream. That's it. I'm glad you're here. I appreciate it. I'm glad you're appreciate not you're in Jersey me. and you're in State College, Pennsylvania. I appreciate it. I'm in this room actually having a nice drink and enjoying this moment with you because we've been talking about it. I know. Babies and work don't always link up with us. And now it happens. So I appreciate That's it. That's right. We got to do it more often. Let's do it. All right, man. Thanks Have again. Have a good one. Thank you. See ya. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. And don't forget to leave us a review. Your support means the world and helps others discover the valuable insights we share. Don't forget to follow Center County Homes on Instagram and like us on Facebook at Center County Homes. And as always, visit us on the web at markmcmaster.com.